Hello, welcome to Zero Production Value Movie Reviews. My name is Eric Hernke. Uh, today we'll be discussing The Leftover Season 2. Uh, as always, this channel is a work in progress, unedited, unfiltered, uncut, uncensored. Um, I have a new camera with a microphone, so hopefully that will uh, amp up the production quality a little bit, so a little bit better than Zero. Uh, like I said, today we're discussing Leftover Season 2 which is an HBO drama that aired in 2015. It was the second season of what would ultimately be three seasons of, of this show. For those who don't know, uh, the basic series premise is that on October something or other, I, for, I forget the exact day, I'm sure cult people are like, oh my god, I can't believe that they like, have it ingrained in their brains. Like, uh, there is a, a definite uh, hardcore cult following for this show. Uh, it's very critically acclaimed and didn't, uh, but didn't uh, catch on very well, which is ultimately why it only ended up with, wound up with three seasons. So the basic premise is that uh, in October of a of a given year, on a certain date, uh, two percent of the world's population just vanished. Uh, nobody knew why; it went unexplained. They were just gone, and the rest of the people were left to figure out how to deal with that. Um, obviously, you could take that into a a, a number of places. There's uh, heavy religious overtones and all that encompasses very like rapturesque and stuff like that. So and that all go that all goes into into the overall plot. We focus on a microcosm in one small town and a, really a small family unit, the Garveys, in and amongst that. So first, let me say from season one to season two. Season one uh, kind of ended. It didn't really end in a cliffhanger, but it did end where you were kind of like, oh, I wonder where these people are going and what they're going to do. Um, by the way, I'm just doing season two here. I'm not doing season one because I'm just going to start reviewing stuff like as I finish watching stuff and hopefully eventually I'll catch up with other reviews and stuff, but uh, you're just going to have to bear with me for that as uh, I can roll more content out and get time to do this. Uh, so we're on season two. First, let me say from season one to season two, like I said, no real cliffhangers, but you did wonder like, wonder where these people are going to go from here exactly. You didn't know. You were kind of interested. So you definitely wanted to see season two and what would happen to these people. First, let me say that season two, as it starts, it starts with a theme song. And I had to stop, like rewind, pause, go back, figure out, am I watching the right show? Because it was so jarring. Season one starts and you have this theme song with this, these very heavy, ominous boom, boom, boom notes. And that's what, that's what you get going into the show. So, And there is a lot of heavy drama in it, although it's not, I would say, depressive. But when you left with that, those heavy, ominous tones, and I think maybe that that's what they were going for in season two. So instead of leaving you with that ominous, oppressive tone going into the narrative, now they have added a theme song, and it's this jaunty, lighthearted bluegrass tune by a singer-songwriter named Iris DeMint called Let the Mystery Be. And it's, like I said, it's a, a, a little jaunty ballad. Um, it's uplifting, even though the, and even though the theme... And it's, it, it feels like somebody wrote that in that world, in that post-departure world. If you listen to the lyrics and stuff, you'll see what I mean. So I was actually shocked to find out that it wasn't written for the show. It was actually written way back in 1992. Never heard of the artist, never heard of the song, but I loved it, and it, it brought the it brought the whole uh, project up a few notches in my book. So just going from there. Uh, so so I, I urge you to look up that song if you haven't, or you know if you have, if you haven't seen the show, at least look up that song. Good good song. Uh, so first season uh, recap. Basically, I'm not going to recap the whole first season, but. Let's just say we're left with, we focus on this uh, Garvey clan, as I like to call them, with the, the basic main character being Kevin Garvey, played by Justin Thoreau, and uh, his makeshift family, which is now his girlfriend Nora, his daughter Jill, um, and a little baby Lily. And then peripheral to them, uh, he has a son Tommy, you know, and an ex, or I guess an estranged wife. I don't know if it's exactly ex, I guess technically he is an ex-wife. In any case, ex-wife. So in any case, they move. They go from Mapleton, New York, where he was chief of police, and season two finds them heading towards a small town called Jarden, Texas. So why would they leave uh, New York for this small 
Nowheresville, Texas. Well, when all is said and done in this world, uh, Jardin, Texas, maybe the only place in the world, definitely the only place in the United States when all, all the numbers have been tabulated that nobody departed from. So obviously this becomes a huge deal. Um, the, you know, it's got some religious fervor surrounding it. It's got uh, the state coming in and they cordoned it off. They've made it a, a, a national park dubbed Miracle. There's a tent city that's sprung up outside. It's gated off. I'm not exactly sure on the geography, but you have to get to it through a gate over a bridge. And that's apparently the only way to get in. Like I said, we don't see a map or anything, so we're just got to take that on faith. Eh, take it on faith. So there's that. So the Garvey clan show up, and Nora buys a house, and so they're allowed access to this town because they own a house. They move in, and their next-door neighbors are the Murphys, uh, this African-American couple. I forget who John Murphy's played by the dad. They have a dad, a son, a daughter, and a mom. The mom's played by Regina King, famous actress, very uh, acclaimed actress. And she does a great job. Acting in this show is amazing. Like, from first season to second season, acting, writing, top-notch. Um, they don't, they don't really, everybody inhabits their role. Nobody really strikes a false note. It doesn't seem overly dramatic. Like, they, they don't, they're not trying too hard. They're not trying hard enough. It all just works. It just works really well. So this season two takes a few main plot tracks, one of which is a holdover from season one, which is uh, Kevin Garvey's somewhat deteriorating mental state. He was basically going crazy in the first season. He was seeing things that weren't there, seeing a man that wasn't there. His dad was a little bit off the deep end, and he was in a mental institution and gets out and then goes away. And so that is a huge theme of season two, his deteriorating mental state. He's starting to see people who aren't there, who shouldn't be there, let's say. And that comes to a head later on in the season. Another track is... There is this entity known as the Guilty Remnant who are, I equate them to like a Westboro Baptist church type. They dress all in white, they don't speak, they smoke a lot, and they're there to make people remember or remind them of this uncomfortable truth of the departure like anybody could really forget. Everybody in this world hates them who isn't a part of them. Every, a lot of fans of the show apparently hate them. I'm not really too well versed in it, but they're a very divisive entity, let's say don't really know what their goals are other than to remind people, make people remember. It's very, it's, they're a tad confusing. Ulterior motives, mixed motives, but since they don't speak, we're not really privy to it too much. They're led, at least in this season, by uh, Meg, who's played by Liv Tyler. And then there's uh, these three missing girls. Pretty, pretty quick in the season, three girls just vanish. And they don't, nobody knows why, nobody knows if they were taken if it was a departure type event. There's a lot of mystery surrounding it, and there's a lot of stuff surrounding Jarden, trying to, this balance of trying to keep this air of, they're like a perfect town or a perfect people, like they were somehow spared, so they're somehow better than everybody else, which we all know is a load of hooey. Uh, there's a running thing uh, throughout, and a mantra that I've taken up, that there are no miracles in Miracle Texas. Um, and so those three plot lines work through. This is a 10 episode season. The first three episodes or so do a good job of setup. The last three episodes do an amazing job of wrapping everything up. The middle, the middle three episodes are kind of character driven episodes, which reminds me a little bit of Lost, which Damon Lindelof, who is one of the creators of this show, did work on Lost as well. So and they had a lot of episodes like that where you would start with a character and you would kind of have the overall narrative move forward, but based on a character's past and then bringing them into the present and then moving the overall narrative forward. And they did that with a few episodes, with more than a few episodes. But it worked really well. Some of them felt like filler, but they did work for the show to have, I mean, the show needed some episodes like that. And then, like I said, you get to the end and the, the, the final few episodes really lift this whole thing up. Like I said, the episode that resolves Kevin Garvey's mental uh, issues, shall we say, is wonderful. And then when we get to the final um, 
final episode, there's it's all leading to something. And I will say, when I got there, the a lot of it has to do with the guilty remnant, and they're planning something big. I don't really buy the execution that occurred here. It was a little bit. I'm like, really? Like, are we supposed to buy that? That's just how that happened. I don't want to really want to get into spoilers. So you'll. I mean, you just kind of have to roll with it. But that it, a slight down check, but not enough to derail anything major. And then when the final scene revealed itself, they didn't know that there was going to be a third season. So it just kind of ends. And it doesn't end, once again, it doesn't end on a cliffhanger, but it ends very satisfactorily so that you're like, ah, that, that I mean, that it, it's not depressive, it's not necessarily uplifting, but it's just, it's just a, it's a perfect, pitch perfect tone. And so you kind of get the feel of why, I don't know if I would raise this as high as some people have. This, this show is, like I said, very critically acclaimed. It's landed on, like, best list of the 2000s, best TV shows of all time. I don't know if I would go that far, but it is really good. And uh, a friend of mine who has ba been badgering me for quite some time has finally gotten me to watch it. And I do appreciate that he, that he did. And it is very good. And I would give The Leftovers Season 2 overall an A-. minus. Alright, thank you for watching. This has been Zero Production Value Movie Reviews. All of this was a television review. I do try to get those in when I can. And uh, like and subscribe. I'll try and get more content up as I can. I appreciate you watching. Hopefully you found something here entertaining.